right, I'm, this is Kale from Zero Tolerance. I'm here with Reed Ackerman from Ghost Fish Brewing. Thank you Hello. for joining us, Reed. Excellent. And I have to say that um, I'm surprised it took this long for me to get in touch with Reed and the guys at Ghost Fish because this is my hometown <laughs> gluten-free brewery, dedicated gluten-free brewery in Seattle. So maybe uh to start off with can you just tell us how you got interested in brewing and um uh, maybe your story about how you ended up being the brewer at ghost fish how'd that happen <laughs> sure i mean this is a pretty familiar tale for you i'm sure it's uh got into home brewing from uh, just teaming up with a buddy in college and uh little extract kit you know nothing nothing interesting but uh just an explosion of interest after that tweaking and buying more equipment and more equipment and more equipment and, and books and just getting really deep into it and uh it just kept that boulder just kept gaining momentum and gaining interest and um then i knew that i wanted to get into it professionally and yeah just just kept kept at it and uh got into the industry that's history how long have you been at ghost fish now uh four years just turned four years so that's almost the whole life i mean ghost fish has only been around for what five or six years now so you've been there for a quite a long time for that yeah yeah it's been fun it's like uh it's changed so much and it's been cool to be around to watch all that change yeah from having like no tanks to having no room for more tanks and yeah it's, it's still growing so it's it's pretty amazing to watch that yeah i've uh i've been going to ghost fish since i'm in seattle north, uh, north seattle so it's just a bit of a drive away for probably since 2016 right and and it is amazing to see like you can from the tap room you can kind of see like oh there's not that much stuff back there then you're like holy shit there's a bunch of huge tanks back there then i started hosting some meetings there you go up on the little mezzanine level and you're like where are you gonna fit anything else right is there there's yeah. like i think brian had said that you guys are gonna like pipe uh <laughs> beer into bright tanks in a in a building behind you so is there is there any more space to fit any more it, it looks like you can barely move in there with all that <laughs> <laughs> it's tight it's tight yeah it makes things tough sometimes um no yeah it's interesting you bring that up because we actually i think next week or the week after that we're actually getting two more bright tanks in which is going to massively increase our capacity uh, we're getting a 60 barrel bright and a 30 barrel bright and that's only the first step i think the intention is still to get another 60 and another 30 to further increase our cold side capacity so we can try to keep up with demand a little better and uh, start pumping out more beer does that excite you or frighten you to have that, money? <laughs> that capacity but there's more ex it, it's a mixture uh more excitement um having those bright tanks is, is critical for, for quality and turnover and all that. So I'm looking forward to it and uh, it'll be nice to see more equipment taking a permanent spot instead of right now it's things move around a lot. There's yeah. a lot of skids moving around. There's no permanent homes, but uh, yeah, it'll, it'll be nice to develop the area more. And um, after we get these tanks in, that's, probably going to be it because there's not much more room down there yeah it sounds like that sounds like i just brewed a beer today and my brewing experience is like where i have everything in a shed out back i have to bring it to the garage i have to run back and forth like a million <laughs> times uh with like a chicken with his heads cut off and then i'm i forget something i gotta run back out there it sounds like you guys got i know that i've seen all sorts of stuff in the the brew house there i mean it seems like you, you gotta kind of plan things out to get things done right <laughs> sure yeah prepping's always good having things ready the day before trying to keep them in an area that's makes sense that's close by helps speed the day along because there's such long brew days you know with 
the gluten free and with our equipment. So, yeah, tell us about um, uh, tell us about your system, like your your mash ton, and and um, I know that you have like what like sixty barrel um, fermenters. What's your mm. what's the kind of system that you guys have and operate with? And do you have like temperature control on your mash ton thing, uh, things like that? Uh, how's that? How's it? How's the setup at Ghost Fish? Sure, it's a fifteen barrel. Uh, two vessel, you know, mash tun, kettle, and we have a 30 barrel hot liquor tank, um, rakes, rakes on the mash tun, which is super nice, uh, steam jacket on both or all of them really, everything's steam jacketed, which is also nice. So we get to do, you know, temp steps in our mash with that. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, and then the grains that you guys are using are you using the traditional like grouse, uh, Eckert's, uh, are those the typical grains that you guys use in your brews? Yeah, well, yeah, we've got the, the classic cocktail, the, the <coughs> rice buckwheat millet, you know, it, it varies depending on which beer, but um, all the flagships have a mix of all of it. Um, branching out a little bit. We've got um, Skagit Valley that's cranking out some gluten-free malts now, uh, primarily the buckwheat. And they're also uh, producing uh, pale millet as well. Are they malting that or? Yes, yes. There's a malt, how is it, uh, is there a name to this? <laughs> Skagit Valley, Skagit Valley Malt. Really, interesting. Yeah. It's great too. Excellent. So mm -hmm. they're doing just pale millet and buckwheat at this time? I believe so. Yeah. The shipping is probably a lot less than from uh, Wellington, Colorado, right? Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It drives down costs. It's just, I just really like being able to use local stuff. You know, like this is all Washington beer. This yeah. Is all from this yeah. State. We've, we've had um, Evan Crane from WSU on, on some of the, um, meetings before and I, you, I'm not sure you probably met him before he was at that magic of presentation uh that uh, Ryan and y'all did and so he was really pushing for you know getting farmers to use millet as a rotational crop in like eastern Washington or whatnot so it would be awesome to see that take more of a foothold so there's a better market for it around here right for sure that'd be great um that's not too far away. You should want great climate for it. And that would help drive costs down more. And, you know, maybe a side effect of that is you see it used more and maybe you see more gluten-free breweries popping up around. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so it takes you what you have to turn four uh, brews over to fill one of those big, huge tanks, right? So is that, done in a single day or how long does it take to fill out one of those <laughs> uh it depends if it's an all grain beer if it's an all grain skew <clears throat> excuse me it's gonna take two days because we'll we'll double batch back to back uh, day by day to, to fill it because a, a double brew day all grain takes all day just with the length of the process with our equipment but say if it's an all extract beer, like the grapefruit, uh, we do that in one day, uh, brew in high gravity, water back. Okay. Yeah. And you guys do a lot, are you like, are you like, oh, I gotta do another grapefruit. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, little bit of, a little bit of resentment on those days, but uh, you know, that pays the bills, pays the bills. Yep, yep, yep exactly. And it's probably one of the, I, I've always said this, it's probably one of the best of all time, like sorghum based uh, beers, I would say. Like, you, that's good to hear. <laughs> in my opinion, right? I would say, like, I mean, I the first and only sorghum beer I ever did was the first gluten free beer I ever did. And yeah, I was it's so super, available. Yeah, I was, it was super excited to do it. So I had my nice whole brew kit. And then I, I got it all done. I got it bottled, got it, you know, uh, let it sit there for a couple of weeks. And then I tried it and I got through about a bottle and a half of it. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I could take this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had some sorghum beers that were uh, 
pretty rough out there. Yeah. Pretty metallic y, tangy. Yeah. So, uh, talk to us about um, you started as a home brewer, uh, and then you went and started doing this gig at Ghost Fish. Uh, so, what's like the main differences between like the home brewing uh, that you used to do and then? these kind of large scale brews that you do at ghost fish. Like, are there any differences or similarities? I mean, sure there are similarities or beer is beer, right? But I'm sure there's a lot of differences that you have to take into account about like, if you're brewing on a massive scale, you can't like take a big pot of water and dump it in to make the temperature <laughs> higher, right? So, so what are uh, the differences? Um, well, shoot, the biggest difference is that I was brewing barley now it's gluten free yeah that's probably the biggest difference right off the bat um probably the scalability of things you know maybe you have this awesome homebrew recipe with all these different ingredients and then you want to scale it up and then you realize oh that's not going to work it, it just doesn't match up with the the nature of the equipment yeah so i'd probably pose that as one of the one of the biggest change uh, change ups between the two. You got to think about, co I mean, maybe not you, right? But someone has to think about like the dollars and cents of it too, right? Like, hey, for sure, yeah. The beer you want to cost a shitload of money, right? So maybe we should <laughs> dream bill down, right? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Uh, yeah, definitely with hops, uh, that that comes up a bit. Like, whoa, why are you using a lot of hops in this recipe? or some really exotic ones, you know, we need to kind of drive that down. Whereas on, on a pilot or a homebrew, you're talking ounces. So no, regardless of how much it costs, it's kind of a non-issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what about like equipment and process? We talked a little bit about equipment. So from a process perspective, uh, uh, we always get really into uh, enzymes and uh, mashing temperatures and things like that. So um, are you, from an enzyme perspective, especially for all grain, well, are, you don't have to go into specifics if you don't want to, but uh, are you guys using like uh, specific enzymes uh, to get, you know, those starches to convert to sugars within your uh, brewing process. Talk to me about like how you guys use enzymes within the brewing process at Ghost Fish. Sure, sure. Um, we've been using a little cocktail of the Visco Firm, the Termomel, and a Tenuzyme for now. And that's that's worked with a worked for us for a while. And that's kind of how I inherited it. It was with those three enzymes. Um, but lately I've been doing just some preliminary work with some different things like the ceramics I'm sure you've heard of and like Omdea Pro and those are really yeah. cool. Yeah. So yeah, I'm kind of, you know, maybe that's somewhere where we can move to, but uh, it's a lot of fun playing around with those and, and kind of getting <laughs> the results, but uh, still too early to like really change that up and bring it over to the brew house side. But uh, that's just what we're working with right now is those three three yeah. traditionals do you guys um have it sounds like you have a some sort of pilot system you, that you mm -hmm. uh brew test batches on or experimentals or tap house stuff is that where you take those experiments with enzymes and things like that or uh and and try to see if those kind of, like work out so so you can go take them to the brew house right yeah yeah it's a little half barrel system um you know we'd all wish it was a little bigger but it's gets the job done you know you spend all day and you get a half barrel it's gone in a week <laughs> but yeah that's where like you know all that stuff gets tested out when when we get the time um it's a it's a you know it's low, lower investment than a than a 15 barrel so if something goes awry okay. it's no big, no big deal really right right it sounds like you don't have a lot of time to do <laughs> like experiment with with all this stuff if you're i mean you have to do just turn around lots and lots of beer all the time right <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm mostly brewing <laughs> yeah yeah i'd love to have more time to to get behind the experimentation side but yeah it's it's 
we're very production focused right now and it's it's yeah. you know me and one other brewer uh-huh so what about you had said something about i think you said it was a steam jacket so what about um mashing temps and i've started uh doing what a lot of people in the home brew club are doing which is like a rising step mash um, using something like ondia pro and ceramex flex uh for instance um i used to do a falling temp um some people do crazy bell curves some people just just do one temp and don't and they don't want to have to mess with like some crazy long mashes so do you guys have a standard type of mashing uh schedule for every single beer or is it kind of customized for each beer and what's kind of what what's your philosophy on on mash temps and all that kind of stuff sure um yeah, it kind of depends on the beer. You know, it depends what the composition of the grist is. Like, do you have a lot of buckwheat or oats? Uh, how much body are you trying to get? Um, size of the grain bill. But typically, we're mashing in at like a standard mash temp that you would expect, like traditional brewing. So, like around 150. Okay. Yeah uh you know into the 140s for certain beers um and then raising up to 175 after a certain period of time raising it up to get that max conversion how long does it take you to get from like 145 to 175 in a 15 uh barrel uh mash ton was what you got today uh it's a little hard to say because in that mash that probe is not super reliable so we've got some limitations around that uh, you know you'll have some hot spots here and there and you kind of have to get a feel for your equipment um, but it really doesn't take that long i'd say probably is happening in 15 minutes really wow uh, wow. yeah it's pretty quick that steam is no joke but um crazy fact. give it a sorry what's that that's crazy fast <laughs> yeah it's it's strong yeah. uh good old steam jacket um but I'll, I'll give it like a bigger window just to make sure that like all that enzyme has reached that temperature yeah and we're getting yeah it's all activated and, and it's not in such a narrow window yeah i was actually it's funny that you mentioned those temperatures because that's exactly what i did today 145 and then 175 rising nice. up and I feel like uh, we had Aaron Gervais from Otherwise on our last club meeting, and he was a big proponent of that uh, two-step uh, with those enzymes just because, you know, he was getting really good results. And I think I got really good results today. So I feel like rice really needs that higher, that really high temperature to get all those uh sugars out of it otherwise it just doesn't seem to <laughs> i think that's what the the higher temperature seems like it's really most useful for rice is that do you do you agree with that that rice needs a little bit of a higher temperature yeah for sure i've definitely seen that in a lot of other people's work on it um we don't use a ton of rice uh i definitely have noticed though that playing around with the temps Kind of cleared up a lot of that why am i getting such bad extract question so yeah i would i would agree with that it's like you definitely need those high temps at least in my in my experience in our, our protocols with it how about yeast uh, we didn't really talk about yeast um i was we were talking beforehand about propagate yeast uh liquid yeast which is really cool for home brewers and that's available but on a uh large scale are you guys just using dry yeast are there certain yeast that you tend to um you know tend to use in in most of your beers um and then i'll follow along to that is do you do you use the same yeast over and over again for several generations sure so yeah we're using uh fermentous products primarily our house strain is the uso5 which is you know just a clean flagship ale yeast, good flock, good attenuation, 
super reliable. Um, we are not repitching right now just due to <laughs> lack of time and uh, personnel, but that's definitely somewhere we're moving towards. Um, obviously, you're going to save a lot of money doing that, and you get better performance out of the yeast through the generations. Um, but we'll probably always pitch dry for certain strains just because of how often you brew it, you know, and it really seems like you can only keep that slurry around for a week tops with, with conventional knowledge right now. So even with repitching, we'd probably still kind of do uh, this and that, you know, we, we pitch wet slurry and we'll have bricks for the, for the one-offs and the, uh, the occasional flagship brews like pretty hard to hang on to a wit slurry you know when you need to pitch that house strain all the time yeah keep it keep that viability and that vitality that you need to make sure it finishes on time for that that canning date that's coming up have you ever, guys ever thought about um like culturing your own yeast strains for uh like liquid gluten-free i mean that's might be a pipe dream but it seems like a lot of work but have you guys have thought about ever doing anything like that culturing our own yeast yeah i have not um yeah that does sound like a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> yeah. interesting though i've done like I, I mean i'm certainly not like plating things but i've done like some wild captures um some fruit skin fermentations, uh, some wild yeasts, uh, but I didn't uh, plate it or, or get it under the microscope yet or anything like that. What about sour? I've, I've been to the, brew, uh, to the brewery where you guys have uh, several sours, right? Do you, I don't know if you guys are, you, what you guys are doing in terms of sour beers. Um, I know that if you're doing sour beers, there's a certain risk of getting all your beers is sour, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the fear. Um, yeah, it's it's a mixed bag. Uh, anything that was packaged was definitely a, a controlled, it wasn't a mixed culture uh, per se. It was either uh, a kettle sour. So, you know, you're inoculating with that lactic acid bacteria, yeah. get into your pH, boiling it and killing it all off and then just fermenting it as a clean beer that just happens to have that acidity. So there's no risk. Yeah. No risk to your equipment, no risk to your brew house. Um, in addition to that, we've played around with a product from Lelmond, uh, Sour Vizier, if, you, if you're familiar with that. Um, I use the, um, I don't know if that one is the Philly Sour. Um, which is another Lalaman yeast, which is a new one that just came out. I think it's kind of very similar, right? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I think that I thought that was just a lactic acid bacteria. Is that a yeast as well? Um, it's uh, yes, it is a yeast. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, I I actually have bottles in my closet of uh, it's Lecanacea. Thermotolerance, I think, is what it's called, and it's called Philly Sour because they cultured it in a like cemetery in off some tree in Philadelphia. Whoa. <laughs> and it's a better name, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so. catch your name. Um, but yeah, we've we've used another one of their products uh, similar. It's um, Sour Vizier. Okay, it's just yeah. a, a sour or uh, acid producing yeast strain so you're it's not only producing alcohols it's producing lactic acid right right yeah. right so you you've been at ghost fish for four years um one of these previous uh, interviews that i did was with jason that was formerly from ghost fish right and oh, right. and um so i and that, it was an interesting question and i talked to also alan from uh all the daily in that he kind of inherited a lot of recipes and then um but he was constantly saying that he was kind of tweaking things or making them different or their own right so uh for the flagship series or whatever that you kind of inherited these recipes right have you still over time kind of changed things around slightly or made things uh maybe the 
you're getting better efficiency. You talk to me about like, well, your take on those recipes and have they changed over time? For sure. Um, yeah, everything's had hands on. Everything's changed at least a bit, some more than others. Uh, a lot of it's process uh, and then some of it's more recipe. But uh, yeah, it was nice to come in with kind of the groundwork already done, thanks to Jason. You know, I'm just gonna come in and you know, start getting the lay of the land and tweaking. But um, I think it's it's natural, anyways, for for your your brands to kind of change over time. And you know, even like the big breweries, that's um, that's just kind of the way it goes. Uh, they make slight tweaks over time. You you might even be imperceptible, and just to just to stay in line with you know customer trends and uh maybe what people are asking for that brand over what it already was yeah 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 and you guys also come out with every year an anniversary series which is usually a pretty pretty big production so what kind of thought like and they usually are kind of like over the top i don't know if uh <laughs> that usually they're pretty strong pretty over the top um different uh, types of beers, right? So when you were thinking about formulating like the anniversary series or what it's gonna be, like you have to do that like a year before or like, when are you guys thinking about how, how long does it take to brew one of those beers? Yeah, that's a good point. It's like, it, it depends what you're, <laughs> what you're trying to do. Like, do you wanna do something barrel aged? Are you trying to do something mixed culture? that's going to affect your time span there. And at a certain point in the year, like I, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about this months out, months out. And as the time's kind of trickling down and just slipping through your fingers, you're busy with other projects. You have to kind of cross a line through some of your more grandiose ideas. Like, Oh, that, yeah. Not going to have time to do that 14 month, uh, bourbon barrel aged stout not going to have time to do this like lambic style super aged blend uh you just gotta keep going crossing out the list as things get pushed back but um yeah it's it's a process um you usually want them to be like big bold uh you know over the top kind of beers or is it yeah yeah more ex more expressive more fun something that'll age probably preferably because i know some people kind of like to hang on to them and, and sometimes we hang on to them too so something that can age well that's usually going to be like a big stout you know or something something along those lines something you can kind of watch change over time and have fun with that and you can compare your bottles do a vertical so when it says they're sold out that's there's really an extra box of them back probably <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, can't comment. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably some back there. <laughs> so, a uh, couple more questions for you. Uh, one question that I thought I thought, thought of this morning, which I thought was interesting, and uh, and of and of course, um, it's something that even I think of as a home brewer is like, wow, man, if I had a like unlimited like blank check to go drunkenly buy homebrew equipment like what would i get to make my life easier right there's certain uh, certain things that like frustrate me about how how my brew my my brew house is set up right and <laughs> yeah and, and i'm like man i should like spend all this money to get all this fancy equipment and then i then i'm like oh no i should probably like get the car fixed or something like that so if you have right. If there's like one thing that just annoys the shit out of you like uh at when you're brewing a beer is it maybe it's just space right uh or it's something with a mash tun what would be the one thing you would fix at ghost fish to make your life like a lot easier oh i feel like i could spend all day on that question uh <laughs> don't worry uh, brian's not gonna hear this no one's gonna hear it <laughs> <laughs> that's a toughie one thing that i would change or invest money in um 
Man, it would be nice to have a mash filter press. Oh yeah, like Hall Daily, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm looking at Hall Daily. Um, that would take so much time off and add so much efficiency. Our screens aren't the best, so like we have to use a lot of rice holes. You know, we've got a long mash. You know, it'd be it'd be great to be able to shave that time off with that kind of equipment. Yeah, for sure. I mean, from what I've never seen it in action, but from what Alan was saying about it, it sounds super awesome, right? Sounds awesome. Yeah, I got to see it in person when we, we took a little tour over there. Uh, what was it, last year? The GABF, were you guys out there for that? Yeah, yeah, that was that was the GABF when it was, when it was still in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, not virtual. Yeah, yeah. So I have just one last question, and um, this is mainly to the, all the home brewers, the people on the home brew club, right? So if you had a suggestion for even a new or even an experienced home brewer in terms of like a recipe, um, it, say they're new to gluten-free brewing, right? What would you be, what would be your suggestion to or it might just even, it doesn't have to be a recipe, just advice uh, as well will work. Like what would be your uh, recipe suggestion or just general advice to a new gluten-free brewer getting started today? Sure. Um, I'd probably say start simple. Don't try to make some like spiced pastry stout right off the bat, like kind of keep it fundamental at first, you know, just something clean and Learn those basics of your equipment and your ingredients. That's that's huge. That's gonna take you far. Just getting getting a solid base to build off of. Yeah, yeah. And don't forget, save your money. Save a shit ton. <laughs> that's all expensive, right? Save your money for all those conicals and barrels and heat yep. exchangers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome hey uh reed i want to thank you for doing this um uh, and taking the time this is great fantastic to get to get to know you and uh and the operation at ghost fish and okay. one more thing before we go just want everyone out there to remember no barley no wheat no <laughs> rye no problem, no problem.